So in the next hour, we'll have two presentations from Sida and Mattis. I'll present them in a second. And afterwards, you'll have time to ask some questions and get yeah about 50 minutes um, Q&A session. Um, you can use the Teams chat to um, type in your questions throughout the webinar or afterwards, and we'll get back on, on, on those after the, after the inputs. But before we come to the content of the webinar, we would like to get to know you a little bit and know who's here with us today. And for this, we prepared a link that's now going to be posted into the, into the chat. So if you click on the link and use the code that's also being posted, you posted. will be directed you to a presenter page. page. And my colleague and Kalina my colleague will, lead will lead you through the next four questions. Yes, um, nice to meet you everyone. Uh, so we've prepared a few questions and um, if you join through that link, uh, you will direct it to a page where the first uh, question is already, uh, should already be available. Um, and I, I will share my screen now so we can look at the answers uh, together. Um, yeah, so the first question is about the location to see where everyone is joining us from. And yes, so let's see if we can. I can share my screen. That doesn't seem to work right now. I think I'm in the wrong screen. Um, but yeah, so the first answers are coming in already. Um, I will leave the poll open for a bit longer until I'm able to share my screen. Alex, are you able to share your right screen? Because for me, it always appears something else. Maybe now I'm. Uh, let me try. Ah, now it should be the right screen. Yes. Yeah, we can see it now. Perfect. OK, perfect. Um, yeah, so. We seem to, to have people joining from quite a few regions. That's nice. Um, yes, I will stop this first question now, so uh, we can move on to the next question um, about the professional background. Um, and you should now be able to access the next question. Um, yeah, here you can answer three freely and uh, we will get word that a word cloud. Yeah, we see we wanted to see whether you're joining us um from the from the climate from the climate sector or you coming in from the engineering sector, um a long time EBA expert or a newbie. So you can just type in what your professional background is, what you've been working on. Yes, I will leave it open for a few more seconds and um, then I will share the results with you. Okay, so we have quite a diverse, um, quite diverse answers, but yeah, most people are joining us from the adaptation and climate sector that's nice i don't see any water infrastructure but yeah with some engineers here the good diverse mix of people today yeah that's going to be a nice discussion later on 
so yeah, the next question is about your EVA experience, um, which should appear now. Yes. So um, we will see how experienced or how much you already worked with EVA. It's unlikely, but maybe you've never heard about EVA <laughs> before or you have some theoretical knowledge about EVA, or you have worked on EVA projects before, or maybe you've even been in the lead of implementing and developing EVA projects. So four, four options. You can probably have a look at the results already. Um, yes, I will stop the poll now. And yes, we have a quite a lot of people that already worked on an EBA project, but also some that have never heard of it before. So we will hear about EBA today. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure so, for us to introduce you to the EBA yeah. concept today. <laughs> <laughs> and so then we move to our last question, which is on expectations and where you can again um, freely enter your answers and we get a word cloud at the end. So looking forward to your answers. Um, and I will also leave it open for 20 more seconds so we get an idea about your expectations and then we can also move on to the speakers that, um, yeah, and we will hope to uh, see to your expectations. So, okay, there's still so many answers coming in, so I will leave it open for a few more seconds. And take a look at them now. Yes, so Alex, maybe you want to say something on the expectations and well, I, I think looking at the expectations, water, EBA, experience, green, knowledge, learning, I think um, what we're going to be hearing in, in the next 50 minutes, um, we have got quite good chances to cover your expectations, I would say. Um, yeah, so I think that's, uh, that's uh, a good transition to actually looking at what we're going to talk about today. And um, today's discussion is actually based on work that we started last year. Um, where the Global EBA project has been collaborating or still collaborating with uh, one of our GIZ sister projects on climate services for infrastructure, CSI, who in turn are providing advisory services to the Nile Basin Initiative. And it's been in this context where the, this particular question how um, EBA can provide or can be a safeguard to water related infrastructure despite of the, the changes that we're going to expect um, from climate change. Um, can function. So um, we can, we have thought about this question for, for the last few months and we can conclude that the answer is yes, it can be a safeguard. And um, yeah, and it's a pleasure to, to me to um, introduce Cedar Morton, who's um, a systems ecologist at ESSA Technologies and he's been working with us on this, on the, this particular question. And um, he will explain to you exactly why and how it can work. So yeah, over to you, Sita. Thanks very much, Alex. I'll just take a second here to get my screen share set up. Yeah. OK. Alex, can you see this on the screen? OK, yeah, we can. perfect, perfect. OK, well, thanks, Alex, and hello, everyone. Um, that was fun seeing the poll. Um, I think I'm probably the only person that is currently awake at midnight during this presentation. Um, <laughs> but it's nice to see a good representation across uh, several different uh, different regions. So um, excited to do this talk with everyone today. And uh, really, this this first part of the the webinar is is getting everyone oriented around 
ecosystem-based adaptation for climate proofing water, water infrastructure. So it's kind of a, a conceptual int uh, overview to get you oriented and to talk a bit about some of the work that ESSA, my firm, uh, has been doing with, with GIZ in this, in this space. So, so right off the bat, there's a lot of jargon in that presentation title. And, uh, and so I, I'll, I'll unpack that a bit as we go through, especially for the folks who uh, said in the survey that ecosystem-based adaptation is a new term for them or a new concept for them. Um, so, and, and for those of you who are used to ecosystem-based adaptation, this is a bit of a different focus than you might be used to because it's specifically focused on water infrastructure as the target beneficiary of ecosystem-based adaptation. And so the, the, the problem that the title alludes to is, is this, with, with projected climate hazards, standard approaches to water infrastructure won't be able to sustain the same service provision as, as it has in the past. And so when I'm talking about water infrastructure, what is it that I mean? I, I'm, I'm talking about examples like, like dams, irrigation pipes, irrigation canals, wells, pumps, pump stations, cisterns, mine tailings ponds, wastewater treatment, and there's many other examples. Um, and so um, what I hope was clear in that very quick series of images is that water infrastructure is diverse, it's used at many scales, and it provides a variety of different services to, to people. And so that's water infrastructure. What about the climate proofing part of the presentation title? <laughs> Um, and so using the IPC's vulnerability framing, which, which views vulnerability as a function of exposure, uh, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity, with increasing climate hazards, water infrastructure will be more exposed to hazards, like floods, like droughts, like seasonal shifts, uh, like storm surges, erosion, landslides, and others. And this ex increased exposure means that water infrastructure will face new impacts, such as direct damages to facilities, equipment, um, increased weathering, and, and importantly, things like supply and demand shifts across both space and time. And all of those things will cause challenges for water infrastructure to provide its intended services and, and will therefore reduce adaptive capacity. So climate proofing is about helping water infrastructure withstand these, cha cha these changes in a, in a way that maintains long-term service provision. And so just a quick note about where this falls within the sustainable development goals. Uh, as I think probably most know on the call, anything related to water um, is really cross-cutting across most of these 17 goals, but um, with the focus on on water infrastructure and climate adaptation, it ties in most closely with, uh, with SDGs 9 and, and 13. So one way to climate proof water infrastructure, which is the focus of this webinar, is ecosystem-based adaptation. And so that's really about harnessing the power of nature and integrating that into, into water infrastructure cycles. So this is the Convention of, on Biological Diversity's definition of, of EBA. It's uh, you, the use of biodiversity and ecosystem services as part of an overall adaptation strategy to help people adapt to the adverse effects of, of climate change. Uh, some of you may be more familiar with the term nature-based solutions for climate change, um, which is also commonly, commonly used. So with the water infrastructure examples that I very quickly rolled through previously, um, we were really talking about one type of infrastructure and that's gray water infrastructure. So water infrastructure can exist along a continuum from gray to hybrid to green solutions or what are sometimes referred to as natural infrastructure assets. But ecosystem-based adaptation is really about 
paying more attention to the rest of the continuum than has been traditionally done in the past. So moving gray infrastructure projects towards hybrid or even green solutions where it, where it makes sense to do so. And that might be applicable to either existing infrastructure or it might be integrated into the development of new infrastructure projects. So this flow diagram that I've got up right now, the text may be hard to read depending on some of your screen setups, um, but that's okay. The, the main point of this slide is to show how different types of ecosystem-based adaptation in the action column can be applied to water infrastructure to support long-term provision of infrastructure services like flood management, water supply, erosion control, um, hydropower production, and, and others. So importantly, one of the nice things about ecosystem-based adaptation is that they can do all this supporting the infrastructure while also providing additional services or, or co-benefits, as they're commonly called, that gray water infrastructure doesn't provide on its own. So in the action column, you see that I've used a couple of terms, protect, replace, assist, accompany. I'm going to go through each of these so I can explain the, the different types of ecosystem-based adaptation. Um, and so the first type of EBA directly protects a hard gray infrastructure project from climate hazards. And, and in doing that, it can increase its lifespan. Um, it can reduce operating and maintenance costs. Uh, an example of a protecting uh, type of uh, EBA would, if you can think about embankments or re-meandering rivers that retain sediment upstream of a dam, thereby extending its lifespan. The second type completely replaces the need for gray infrastructure. So you can think of wetlands, for example, that if they were restored, maybe retain enough water during floods that gray infrastructure is, is no longer needed downstream. Now, the third type doesn't protect or replace gray infrastructure, but it assists it by amplifying its service provision. So um, you can think of a restored wetland in combination with a dam, for example, that both provide flood management services. And then the final type uh, is an interesting one because it doesn't really benefit the gray infrastructure at all, but it accompanies it as an add-on to a project. And so we're thinking about water infrastructure project cycles here. And um, because we're thinking at that project level, um, one of the things that can be done is that um, ecosystem-based adaptations could be implemented as part of a project to provide co-benefits that increase a community's overall adaptive capacity to, to climate hazards, even though it's not really doing anything um, with respect to the, to the focal services. You might think about riparian planting to provide green space. Um, and so there are several examples of ecosystem-based adaptations. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time showing you pretty these pretty pictures that I have in my slide deck because I know Matisse is, is going to, um, he's got several more in store for you and we'll, we'll go into more detail about some specifics, but um, I will roll through a few examples just to get you oriented. And uh, so river re-meandering is one option. Uh, the creation of side channels is another. Floodplain widening, green embankments, riparian planting, forest restoration, land use management, wetland restoration. So those are all um, examples of different ecosystem-based adaptations that could be harnessed to, um, uh, to uh, assist water infrastructure. So that's great. So now we've got a way of thinking about ecosystem-based adaptation with respect to water infrastructure specifically. Uh, but what about operationalizing it and taking it to the actual project level? So some of the work that S has been doing with GIZ is looking at exactly that by articulating EBA insertion points within a water infrastructure project cycle. So uh, what I have up on the screen right now is an example of a standard project cycle, although we've um, placed it within a, an adaptive cycle. So you've got the 
adaptive plan, do, learn cycle happening uh, around the outside. And then in the inner circle, there are the typical stages that most infrastructure project cycles will go through. So problem definition, um, development of project alternatives, then selection of projects, mobilizing the resources in order to be able to do the project, actually building it, then operating it and maintaining it. And importantly, in the context of climate change adaptation, monitoring the uh, effectiveness of the project and, excuse me, evaluating and adjusting uh, based on, on the results of that monitoring. So where does EBA fit into these different components of a project cycle? Well, there's a few things that we've identified in the work with GIZ that um, are different. Uh, and they're, they're unique considerations for ecosystem-based adaptation that um, are things that traditionally water people that are engaged in water infrastructure projects don't always have to think about. And so with EBA, you might be doing something like um, including wanting to include a wetland upstream of a dam uh, that will provide additional flood uh, flood protection benefits or stop some sediment from filling up the reservoir too quickly. And suddenly that introduces new uh, spatial scope to the project. Um, some ecosystem-based adaptations might have be seasonal in their benefits, and so that could affect the temporal scope of the project. And of course, when you're extending the spatial scope, suddenly you might be looking at things like new jurisdictions, um, could be different countries, could be different states, could be different municipal areas, um, but also different affected groups. And so this affects how you structure the participation that uh, is necessary in order to, to develop the, the, the project. So when we get into the project alternatives, um, developing project alternatives and, and selecting projects. Uh, there's a few uh, different steps like developing a natural asset inventory so that you know what the options are that are available um, in terms of ecosystem based adaptation. But important one is also cost benefit analysis. And so um, a lot of these additional unique features of EBA sound more complicated and expensive. And so that's one of the reasons why it's important to consider uh, things like the co-benefits that ecosystem-based adaptation can offer when cost-benefit analyses are being conducted. And when you start thinking about co-benefits, um, monetizing the value of those co-benefits is a bit different than it would be for traditional infrastructure projects because you're starting to need to utilize um, different economic valuation methods uh, to get at some non-market values that might be represented uh, by ecosystem-based adaptation alternatives. Also, as a standard part of a project cycle, there's uh, or an infrastructure project cycle, there's different, uh, there's usually a project level risk assessment um, with uh, the introduction of EBA you suddenly are thinking about new types of risk and you're also looking at um, what are the risks to the ecosystem-based adaptation um, or the natural asset, but also how does the introduction of that natural asset affect how you perceive or identify risk thresholds for the actual infrastructure that's, um, that is the target beneficiary. Also, uh, Developing indicators of risk uh, is much more complex when you when you introduce ecosystems and, and natural assets and likely also requires additional sensitivity analyses in, in any modeling that's being conducted to compare uh, to compare the, the costs and pros and cons of different alternatives. During the construction stage, if you're doing things like adding um, sandbars to re-meander rivers or gravel to re-meander rivers, for example, you, you might be working with different materials. Um, riparian planting is another example um, and different activities. And these things might require personnel with, with different sets of expertise than are, than are typically utilized uh, during 
during standard infrastructure projects. And um, during the operation and maintenance stage, ecosystem-based adaptation um, or natural assets might have different deterioration rates and lifespans compared to things like dams. Um, and finally, in the monitoring step, um, there's several complexities. So monitoring is all about developing indicators, um, but this is hard to do when you've got, um, you're dealing with natural systems that have complex long-term changes with multiple systems drivers. Um, sometimes it can be really hard to define causal pathways and uh, every site's different. So you might have unique indicators at every different site. So there's no real consistent way to have a similar set of indicators across multiple projects. Um, and then you might be dealing with longer time horizons to observe ecosystem-based adaptation benefits. Um, one of the, the great advantages of EBA is that um, it can rely on the um, free benefits of nature for maintenance and operations over time. Um, but those benefits aren't necessarily realized right away um, when, when a project is, is constructed or completed might take time, you might need to dredge a side channel um, multiple times over many years before it actually is at a level where it's providing a full set of benefits and self-maintaining. Um, and then lastly, there's a whole portfolio of ecosystem services, obviously, that need indicators to be tracked. Um, and so it adds this level of complexity. Thankfully, um, GIZ and partners um, have developed a library of EBA guidance documents, and um, these are quite useful. I've found them quite useful myself on the project uh, that we've been working on um, that give a lot of information about how to do monitoring and evaluation and climate risk assessment and cost benefit analysis um, for ecosystem based adaptation. So these are all uh, resources available from 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 GIZ. And that is it for my part of the presentation. Thank you. I think um, Alex, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, Matisse, Matisse is up next. Thank you, Sita, very much for this interesting presentation. Um, please, everybody, feel free to post questions into the chat or comments. I see lots of uh, clapping hands here coming up. Um, we will attend the questions after after the next input. Um, yeah, let's continue straight away. Our next speaker is Matthias Bow. He's uh, an associate professor of practice at the Weizmann School of Design at the University of Pennsylvania. He's the founder of One Architecture and Urbanism, and he's co-authored the book Building with Nature, and he's here today with us. And he's going to share with us his experience on shifting from uh, grey to green building or hybrid building from a private sector's perspective. Matthias, the floor is yours. You're still on mute. That's the first step. Let me see if I can share my screen here. Um, hang on. Let me do it like this, and then you see my PowerPoint now? Yeah, we can see right. it up. That's perfect. perfect. So uh, uh, thank you, Alex, for the invitation, and thank you, Cedar, for the uh, uh, great setup for, for, for my talk. Um, I would like to talk a bit indeed about about the book but also uh, why i find these nature-based solutions or ecosystem-based adaptations so critical and leave off with some thinking about what you need to do in order to get such uh, projects implemented and the reason i'm very interested in this is as a design company that indeed works in the in the private sector we are involved with a lot of the bigger uh, coastal adaptation projects in the world, such as these in uh, New York City. And we find out how difficult it is to build these um, out in in relatively, even though they look green, uh, a gray or a hybrid infrastructure. And we realize that at the magnitude of climate change, um, these gray solutions will not uh, help us. So we need to learn how to understand and harness the forces of nature better, and we need to 
learn how to do that at uh, scale. And uh, we're not the only one who think that. Uh, fortunately, there's a lot of uh, people uh, who have, uh, including GIZ, uh, who have been really at the forefront of making sure that nature-based solutions uh, for climate resilient infrastructure are developed and are uh, mainstreamed uh, across the globe. But this is really uh, a development that is very much at the beginning for which we still have a lot to learn. Uh, one of the places where a lot of the learning has been going on in the last 10 years has been in the Netherlands, uh, which of course has a, a long tradition of doing uh, a hydrological engineering uh, uh, projects and in the Netherlands, there's an organization called EcoShape, which is a consortium of all kinds of different uh, consultants, NGOs, uh, scientific institutes who have been uh, developing uh, nature-based solutions uh, for hydrological engineering projects and uh, who have been monitoring them and trying to come to an understanding of uh, uh, how to advance this. And with that organization, we teamed up to uh, write a book called Building with uh, Nature, Creating, Implementing and Upscaling Nature-Based Solutions. And I would like to use a bit the frame of the book to talk a bit about how we have been approaching this. Uh, out of the different projects that we sort of evaluated globally, we uh, came up with a set of uh, Building with Nature concepts that we have subsequently placed in a number of uh, fictive landscapes. And we sort of said, well, there, there's um, a sandy coast, there's muddy coast, this is an image for muddy coast, there's rivers, there's cities, there's lowland lakes, and in all these areas and ports, you can imagine uh, using these type of uh, concepts. So let's try to frame them in a landscape, think which ones are appropriate, and out of that describe the ecological benefits and we visualize this for instance uh, in in a muddy coast where we especially in, in in this case looked at the species variety that uh, could be found in the different uh, habitats that would be created but in which we also talked a bit about the uh, flows in uh, uh, of, of sediment and of, of waves um, we talked a bit about the sort of economic and, and community benefits that come with nature-based uh, solutions. Often they provide, uh, specifically in, in emerging economies, uh, great uh, assets for, uh, for local uh, development, for strengthening uh, agriculture. And we uh, talked about how, uh, let's say, the resource flows would uh, work because uh, similarly, in uh, they, they have climate functions such that they can sort of trap uh, carbon often, they can trap sediment, which is great if you uh, want to make sure that uh, uh, subsidence doesn't drown your um, uh, ecosystem uh, ecosystems. You can use the uh, clay uh, for different functions, etc. And then most importantly, we said, well, you cannot think of these type of solutions without looking at, let's say, the social or the institutional context uh, through which they uh, come about. You need to think about how uh, you can learn about these uh, 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 solutions. You need to create the institutional capacity to uh, work on these solutions. Uh, you need to uh, make sure that you have the institutions on uh, board that can uh, uh, foster these uh, uh, solutions. So we really need to think in a very integrated way about these type of uh, solutions. And I'll talk about a few in, in the context of uh, the intersection between climate adaptation and uh, uh, grey uh, infrastructure. And one of them uh, is uh, what we call uh, vegetated foreshores, which can be found in lake environments, but also in other uh, environments. And vegetated uh, uh, foreshores are basically uh, uh, nature-based solutions that improve dike resilience and with that enhance flood defenses by dampening the wave forces with the shallow slopes 
uh, and they stabilize uh, the, the structures of, of levees or uh, dikes with additional mass. And they, uh, by, by creating uh, a space outside, they, 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 they can also keep salt water uh, out. And then, of course, the vegetation on there further reduces the wave strength and creates all kinds of environmental uh, benefits. <laughs> Uh, basically, we try to describe how these, uh, how you work, how you how you can sort of grow these vegetated foreshores in front of your uh, levee systems, as you see here happening in the Netherlands, where uh, we've done a lot of experimentation uh, uh, with this, uh, often in smaller uh, pilots. And where we've now really come to understand the, 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 the significant uh, positive impact they have on the grey infrastructure that they often help protect. If we go to the global south, uh, we, we have something similar in restoring mangrove belts. We, this is another landscape. Uh, mangroves, of course, uh, help uh, similarly protect uh, uh, infrastructure or villages uh, from <laughs> Uh, 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 waves, uh, but they also create again a lot of uh, ecosystem uh, uh, benefits. But what they do uh, specifically is also capture sediments, and that makes sure that in places where you have a lot of subsidence, which is often in uh, deltas uh, globally, they help the land from uh, sinking. And of course, they are a great habitat for uh, all kinds of animals, which then improves the uh, uh, the agricultural yields. And this is a project that Wetlands International, uh, together with EcoShape, organized in the MAC in Indonesia. The third one that we are very interested in in urban environments is to use floating structures which also increase uh, or decrease wave and uh, which have a lot of ecosystem benefits or which vetments can be used in ports, but also in other landscapes that really help to improve the biodiversity at the base of uh, levee uh, or dike uh, systems by creating changes in the texture form and material of the heart structure so that ecosystems can find themselves in there. And they often form great places for divers. So one of the things that I would like to conclude is, is when building these projects, we thought a lot about what makes these projects possible. What are the enablers of these uh, uh, projects? And we identified six which of course need to be understood in relation to each other. But I'll try to talk about the six. The first one is institutional embedding. Building with nature should fit into the local institutional context. It's really important to understand the local norms and regulations and try to work through co-creation with the local institutions by forming partnerships the institutional environment that makes these type of projects possible. Cedar already talked about that. The second one, uh, Cedar alluded to that as well, is we need to develop business cases. These type of solutions uh, uh, perform a host of benefits which are not easily captured and which are often coming from different domains and with that have different types of funders. So it's really important to, to develop a business case where you can stack the potential benefits and funding sources such that you make these possible. A third one is that these uh, is to understand that these systems are dynamic. We have a changing climate and that means that we need an adaptive approach to maintain, manage and monitor the performance in the long term. We need to learn from them in order to continuously improve them. We need to work on these with multi-stakeholders. These are unlike gray infrastructure, which often has a sort of clear uh, a set of stakeholders and a clear set of institutions responsible for them. They, these can rarely be implemented by a single uh, party. So it's really important, and that's where we often come in as, as uh, designers, to, to uh, uh, do a lot of stakeholder engagement from the start through all the phases of the uh, design, implementation, operation and maintenance. 
we need to build up the technology and systems knowledge. We're only at the beginning of using these type of concepts. And that means we not only need uh, uh, knowledge of the physical uh, 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 factors of the, uh, of the solutions, but also the ecosystems, the social systems, which are equally important for these type of solutions. And then, of course, in order to scale that, we need to build capacity. And we're great to see this community trying to uh, do that. Um, a conclude on our current project. Uh, we are under the guidance of Wetlands International working uh, with Building with Nature Asia, where we basically use the experiences and the learnings from uh, DEMAC in uh, northern uh, Java to scale first in Indonesia and then across the continent in five other countries using landscape propositions and using our understanding and, and, and these concepts and our understanding of these type of solutions in different places to get to the collectively with all the local institutions and stakeholders and communities iterate new projects so that we can start scaling it across the region but that we can also build a regional platform for knowledge and capacity building policy and financing and uh, buy-in and awareness to really bring out the message of what nature-based solutions can do and how they can complement gray infrastructure thank you very much for your time today have a great day Thank you, Matthias. Thank you, both of you. Um, so, yeah, we have not received questions in the chat. I guess that's a good sign because the presentations apparently have been so clear. There are no open questions. But, um, yeah, please, everybody, um, use the, this opportunity now to ask some questions to Matthias and Sida. You can even unmute your microphone and just directly um, speak up or if you want to still use the chat functions. So we have a few minutes left to answer Q&A and um, yeah, the floor is the participants floor now. Here's where one question on sharing the PowerPoints. Yeah, we will make sure we were actually intended to post it here into the chat, but for some reason I don't seem to be able to post any documents. That's a new thing. I've not experienced that before, but um, we will make sure that um, you'll you'll get it. We'll find we'll find a way. Are there any questions? So here's one question, Matties. Any experience in Africa? Risks and challenges from Ngozi. Um, very limited experiences. Uh, it, uh, we have very limited experience in in Africa. Um, we we have just started to work uh, in supporting Wetlands International and a couple of other NGOs on a project which looks at the different wetlands uh, in uh, sub-Saharan uh, Africa in the in the Sahel, um, like the Inner Niger Delta and and. Uh, uh, the Delta in, in, in Senegal and, and, and also uh, the area uh, which a lot of people should be familiar with in, and I'm sorry that I lost the name, in the, in the Nile in South Sudan, where, where of course you have these uh, wetlands. Uh, but for us, I cannot really talk with any confidence about uh, uh, Africa, but, but we do know that both on the West African uh, coast as well as along the uh, Nile uh, basin, there are uh, uh, plenty uh, opportunities to uh, uh, explore uh, nature-based solutions uh, for climate adaptation. Cool, thank you. I now see that uh, we were able to post your presentations also, and there's another question that came in, where to find the write-up or the reports of the six pillars that you described, Matties? Yeah, so um, they are described in more detail in the book, and I saw Susanna from Wetlands post the link to the book in the 
in the chat already, but EcoShape uh, and I think at .org have a fantastic website at which they also put a lot of their information. So if you look at EcoShape, I think it's .org, otherwise it would be .nl. You can find a lot and there are not only there the uh, enablers and the concepts and the landscapes, but also a lot of the supporting white paper that can help you uh, dive deeper, deeper into this. Okay, great. Suzanne has also just posted a link um, to the EcoShape webpage where you can find all the information. Then we have a question from Juan Carlos, who's wondering whether there's any experiences in integrating EBA into hydropower development, particularly small hydro. So to bring in this new perspective and project that have have been uh, that have been negotiated for decades, I think that's a question for Cedar. Um, <laughs> thanks, Alex. Um, no, I cannot say that I have any experiences um, integrating EBA into hydropower development yet. Um, I, I do work closely with different hydropower projects um, usually on larger scales uh, not small hydro yet um, but it is something i'm definitely tracking and um, intend to promote as i go along with my clients on, on large and small hydropower projects so okay. a, a, a thing that i can imagine yes. for hydro and, and i'm not a specialist in any way on hydro and don't have any experience with it is that um, you with hydro you often create uh, ponds or lake environments and that means that uh, the shores of those uh, environments um, uh, will provide I think great opportunities for uh, biodiversity enhancements and uh, with that, uh, probably uh, all kinds of economic uh, uh, opportunities for, for local uh, 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 populations. Okay, thank you. Um, then we have a question uh, from Vanessa. I would like to know about your experience in, urban, in the urban context. Key takeaways and recommendations you can give for starting a partnership to pilot some nature-based solutions for adaptation in the urban context? So, um, as a firm that, that normally works in urban contexts, um, we are very interested in that, in that question. And we, we also realize that it is often really uh, difficult. And it is uh, difficult because, uh, uh, let's say, the in some way the, the sort of the pace of development like nature-based solutions they take time to grow and often development in urban contexts doesn't give you that time and so it is really critical to start introducing conversations about nature-based solutions very early and at a really at 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 a, at a sort of high almost master plan uh, uh, level in the Netherlands we're working on a project for a sort of new town which will start to be built in uh, after 2030 and we are now starting to explore how you can start using the nature based solutions to really lay the foundation for a climate robust uh, new town and so i think and that's a real challenge that it's uh, definitely possible. There are some regulatory challenges that I will not go into it, but you really need to make sure that you're early and then have a very inclusive approach in co-developing nature-based solutions with the other development that is taking place in urban areas. Thank you. And then um, we have another question from Luciana. Uh, what are the experiences with water security for water supply? She's wondering, um, she's working on, on EBA in a hydro hydrographic basin and supply company in Brazil. Who would like to answer this question? You want to take this? You still mute, Cedar. Can you repeat the question, Alex? Sorry, the I was question just trying is, to follow um, it. 
you have experiences with water security for water supply. I'm working with um, EBA in a hydrographic basin and supply company in Brazil. Otherwise, if it's not clear, maybe Luciana, you can also speak up and um, and ask the question yourself again. Sorry. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I'd like to know if you have some experience with this uh, subject about the watershed and water supplier because we are uh, working in Brazil with a company uh, about the water scarcity about climate uh, because the climate change is affecting this the water supply and we are looking for solutions based on ecosystem services about land use um, something like this and i'd like to know if you have some experiences about this so I, uh, go ahead well I'll, I'll, i will say I, I don't have a lot of experience with it most of the experience that i have working with um at the project level with nature-based solutions is at the municipal scale looking at things like uh, coastal infrastructure um, and natural assets for storm surge protection, like some of the examples that uh, Matisse showed. Um, but I will say that um, I think in terms of water security, um, nature-based solutions and, and ecosystem-based adaptation have a lot of potential, and, and I'm sure Mat Matisse can, can share some more specific examples. Yeah, I mean, there's in terms of water supply, it is we need to get better and better at keeping water in the system, right? And and to make sure that as uh, uh, extremes in precipitation are sort of uh, managed a bit uh, because those are increasing. And, and so we need to create spaces for water storage. And often you find that these nature-based systems uh, can do that really well. They can uh, sort of keep water in the system and in the process also uh, clean it and uh, uh, improve the quality of the of the water. So using nature-based solutions uh, uh, specifically to sort of uh, feed your drink water supply and to think along across the entire basin uh, or the entire watersheds, uh, how you can uh, manage your flows of of water using nature-based uh, uh, solutions is uh, it, it's I think it's more commonly it's starting to be commonly used and it is a, a really important uh, field of research. Thank you. Then we have a question here from Nicholas who's got a pretty question on the cost benefit analysis whether this applies to comparing either protection and replacing or comparing costs of production and replacing or comparing costs and benefits for gray or green. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I caught that question. Thanks, Niklas. Nice to see you as well. Um, so cost benefit analysis um, is just, it's really a step that's taken um, at the stage in the project cycle where you're starting to compare different project alternatives. So I, I think the, the easiest answer really is all of the above. Um, if you have a protection or replacing or any other option um, that might be under consideration, then you'd want to compare that alongside uh, a, a purely gray infrastructure alternative. And the key there, um, as I discussed and as Matisse, Matisse also mentioned, is to uh, make sure that the co-benefits of the nature-based solutions are being considered in that, in that cost-benefit analysis. OK, may thank I, you. Yeah, go ahead. May Matisse. I add one, one, one element to the question that Vanessa asked about the urban context? I, I really talked about sort of be early and, and think at a, at a high plan level. But I now read in her question that she asked uh, about the idea of piloting these type of projects. And while I think they are most effective when you think long term, Given the fact that that you that that they really need to be structural interventions, pilots are great tools to buy commitments to show that things is possible, 
to to practice uh, uh, maintenance regimes uh, to get people enthusiastic about uh, uh, these type of elements. So, where I talked about long term and and high skill, uh, uh, police uh, pilots are are very good things. We can learn a lot and create a lot of enthusiasm through them. Okay, thanks for this addition. There's another question from Benjamin who's wondering about coastal protection as, as it has been necessary for centuries, how to make sure to choose or test the most appropriate adaptation solution in terms of existing based adaptation. Yeah, and I don't know if the word is, is testing, but th th there's a couple, like with the foreshores in general, they, um, the, the ones that I showed, they, they uh, reduce because they stabilize and they attenuate waves, they uh, reduce the heights that is necessary for dune systems that, that need to be built or levee systems that uh, uh, need to be built. And, and uh, those, uh, the, the scientific literature uh, on that is starting to become uh, uh, more prolific. And that means that we can start to work with them uh, uh, better and 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 combinations of levy systems with wave attenuation systems like revetments like foreshores like artificial uh, reefs that you can uh, uh, make are often uh, really efficient and and also allow you to build increased protection over time uh, uh, you can in some way continue to elevate your dikes, but by starting to grow nature-based solutions in front of dikes, you can often keep the elevation of the dike in place and uh, let the um, uh, nature-based solutions do the, do the work of, of uh, uh, mitigating at least a, like a couple of feet of uh, sea level rise. And that, is is often quite cost efficient. So, I I think we're starting to see uh, some uh, uh, more applications of of those what you in some way called multi layered uh, uh, defense systems. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we are we finish actually. Uh, Time is time is up. I I think we can maybe take a couple more questions as we have still quite a few. Um, for example, there's hack asking whether um, the, whether the restoration of of damaged dams co is considered as an EBA solution, and in this case, the dam is used for water supply purposes. So restoration of damaged dam. I would, I'll take a shot of that, Matisse, <laughs> if that's, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, I would say that if restoration of the damaged dam is happening in conjunction with uh, natural assets, if they're being utilized in some way to encourage or enhance that restoration, then, then yes, that falls within the EBA framing. Um, if it was just gray infrastructure alone, um, being refurbished, then it's it's a different thing. Yeah, thanks. And for how long are these projects monitored for to establish long term benefits? Is it over 10 years or ongoing? That's a question from <laughs> Caroline. It's a great question. <laughs> um, I, I, I think that it really depends on the, the nature of the project and the the natural assets that are being monitored and um, it's, you know, sometimes it can be dictated by things like the projected lifespan of a dam. Um, but if you're adding a wetland into the mix, for example, well, then um, what's the li what's the lifespan of the wetland? <laughs> Hopefully it's, you know, it extends beyond the lifespan of the dam um, and could still be providing benefits, which means you could have a monitoring program that it extends indefinitely into the future. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, last question. Um, that one's for you, Matiz. Um, not yet. Um, sorry. Um, who are mainly your your clients? 
uh, sorry, now the chat just moved away. And what does it take to engage um, the private sector in financing nature-based solutions? Um, I think those those are two different questions. We mostly work for, in the broad sense, the, the public sector. Uh, there are some sort of private-ish type clients like port authorities or or whatever, but but mostly because of the scale of these interventions, they they are uh, a, a public sector. Um, there's some toll. We're working with a toll road company in Indonesia. Um, so so so, but, but in some way that's also like public sector ish. We would like to work more with private sector, and I think that the private sector is is starting to come on board. But with but with bigger developments, we we've seen that with artificial islands that are being planned in Malaysia and and things like that, because we do feel that the private sector at scale can play a role here. In terms of financing, I think you often look at, at multiple sources of uh, uh, financing. Um, public sector financing or international financial institutions um, is one. Uh, donors is uh, a, a second one. But you often find that there are uh, private sector vehicles to help finance these type of solutions. The insurance industry is exploring uh, some of those. They, for instance, insured a, a reef in, in, in Mexico uh, through, uh, and, and so they, they can help with, with that. And what you, what you uh, find is that there are new financial models which are based on, let's say, outcome-based financing or impact investments that that are starting to enter these uh, space. So in the US, we're working with uh, a group called Quantified Ventures to, to develop financing models for these type of solutions driven by private sector capital. I'll chime in there too, if it's okay, Alex, because um, some of the work that I do, I posted a link in the in the chat to the, it's the mnai.ca. Um, link. I, I work closely with a lot with an organization uh, in Canada called the Municipal Natural Assets Initiative, and their focus is um, on uh, basically helping municipalities um, get to the point where they can start thinking about how to integrate uh, natural asset management into their accounting systems. So treating natural assets as a type of infrastructure in their infrastructure accounting. And so a lot of the work that I do with them is developing models to compare, you know, what what are the benefits with or without natural assets and putting dollar values on that. So getting getting to a monetization so that they can start to think about what the value of those benefits are um, and, and integrating in them into their accounting. So it's different than private sector um, funding, but uh, but it is one way of getting at, at at funding these projects. Okay, thank you very much uh, to both of you, to everybody for your participation. Um, I'd like to conclude the session now, even though we weren't able to answer all questions, but um, some people already had to leave and we all have tight schedules. Um, thank you very much, Sida, Matches. Thanks to everybody else. Um, if you have any questions, please get in touch with me via email. Um, we are looking forward to our Hello. next webinar. Take care, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.